Hi, welcome, Saurabh, to the interview. And yeah, uh, thank I'm going you. to see me in front of me. And uh, yep, so just to let you know that this call will be recorded uh, for uh, on the social media like YouTube and others, and uh, that you are okay with that. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay with it. Okay, all right. Uh, so yep, uh, I've got your CV in front of me. So why don't we start up with uh, your career progression and uh, and then we'll have some follow-up questions. Yeah, like first of all, thanks a lot for this uh, opportunity. You know, I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Saurabh uh, Ravankar. Uh, uh, I will start with how I got into the DevOps and cloud uh, technology domain. So I did my bachelor's of engineering in mechanical field. But uh, whilst I was in third year, I got interested into the computer science. So then I started learning about the Python, uh, basics of Python. And then later during the COVID period, period that's when I met my mentor. He uh, like taught me a lot of DevOps and cloud technologies. And uh, the most important thing he did was not only taught, but he created my interest in that field genuinely. So I really followed that and uh, whilst I was in fourth year, I got my opportunity in one of the largest consultancy company in India. And since then I've been working there as a DevOps and cloud engineer uh, for two and a two year and four months as of now. So that's a uh, uh, little bit about my work uh, related things. Uh, about my personal things, I live in the uh, town of Maharashtra uh my hobbies are like i like to read books i also like to work out and just stroll in the nature so yep. yeah that's a little bit about me awesome awesome uh, all right so i see from your resume sort of that uh, you have uh, experience in aws uh core pipeline ci cd uh, python and lambda uh, also used amazon quick site for visualizations and dashboard so how how about uh how about Docker and Kubernetes? Yeah, I also know a Docker and Kubernetes. Okay, all right. All right, let's start up with some of the AWS questions. So I'll start right from the basics. Uh, so in terms of AWS security, so there's something called as uh, NACLs. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me more about NACLs and uh, uh, how does it, how's it, how does it differ from subnets? Yeah, so NACLs are the firewalls uh, applied at the subnet level. Uh, there is another thing called a security group in AWS, uh, which somehow relates to it. Security, but there is a difference that NACLs are stateless. So it means that you have to specify specifically the inbound as well as outbound rule. Whether mm -hmm. as the security groups which are attached at the individual resource level like instances, uh, they are stateful. So you just have to mention like inbound and they will automatically gather that uh, outbound is also allowed. Mm -hmm. So that's what an NACL is. Right. Uh, now in terms of your EC2, uh, there's something called as volumes which can be attached. Right? Yes. Uh, you've got elastic block, uh, block stores uh, and volumes. Uh, can yeah, you yeah. tell me what are the different types of volumes and, uh, and what do they're used for? Yeah, so like volumes are the like persist are mounted for having the persistent storage to our EC2 servers, and the block storage is the EBS that AWS offers. Uh, in terms of different types of uh, volumes, so there are like GP2, which are like uh, SSD based. Then there are uh, IOPS uh, heavy uh, volumes, so where you can have a uh, if you want the uh, have application that has heavy read IO, then you can use the IOPS type of uh, volumes. Then there are also some machine learning related uh, volumes, I guess. I don't remember uh, them particularly, but yeah. So mm -hmm. these are some types of uh, volumes. So I'll just give you a scenario and uh, you can explain me uh, on the on the questions on it. Okay, so yeah. let's say uh, you've got a three tier or a four tier application. Uh, and you are asked to design the application from scratch. Uh, so you've got mm -hmm. the app, app layer, uh, you've got an API layer, uh, you've got uh, the business logic, uh, you've got web layer, you've got databases, uh, you're using S3. So, so these, these are, it's a standard sort of application. So in terms of cloud security, how would you secure an application and what are the different uh, attributes that you would have in your application to make it uh, consistently secure? Okay, so let's start with the things that I will include. Uh, so first is database layer, second is application layer, 
and third is suppose the client accessing the things from internet so that's three tier so i would probably use a api gateway or application load balancer in this architecture where i will put just the alb or api gateway in the public uh, subnet where it has access to the external internet and i will put my app server in different private subnet and i will put my database server in different private subnet and then just connect my api gateway or alb to the private web server and web servers will have access to the database servers privately and yeah like uh, and the clients can access my application on, on the ip address or domain name of the alb which are mapped to it so that is how i would uh, like architect it okay are there any other security measures that you can think of yeah like we can have the like if your web server needs access to the database and suppose your database is in rds so you can have a proper iam permissions iam instance profile for your instances uh, in web servers also you can have proper knuckles uh, the security groups following the least privileges uh, rule as the aws uh, suggests uh, so those are some of the security things that you can take in consideration anything else that you can think of uh you can also add uh, like aws wap or something like that if you want the extra security so if you want ddos protection so maybe mm -hmm. you can use wap and uh, if you want to like check the your instances for like uh, security vulnerability then maybe use the aws inspector or something like that okay last chance to say something else uh looking for one more point you did well but one more point there is a ptc there is subnet it's alb uh security groups is there i am is there uh All maybe right. like storing the database passwords or something like that you can use a uh, secrets manager for that yep uh, <laughs> how about how about you how would you secure a data tell me about data encryption so data encryption if it's in transit then you can use the obviously ssl for that ssl certificates uh, mm -hmm. and if it's at the rest then you can in terms of aws you can use a service like aws kms uh, where you can have different options for managing the keys either aws can manage me it or like you can manage it and uh, you can encrypt the data at rest using those keys okay can you tell me the difference between a uh, server side encryption and client side encryption yeah so i would say server side encryption is something that uh, we do like as a app server where like uh, suppose data is at rest so that's where you are uh, encrypting your data so that's i would say server side encryption and client side encryption is something that if client is sending the data then you are using the ssl uh, key uh, that public key to encrypt the data so i would say that would be client side encryption okay all right uh now coming back to tell me tell me why would you why would you need auto scaling and what are the different types of auto scaling available uh so auto scaling is required if you have a varying terms of traffic to your applications and you want to automatically scale your instances or containers whatever uh type of deployment you have done and uh, so you don't need manual intervention suppose the traffic is uh, exceeding beyond uh, what your cpu levels can handle so you don't need to manually increase go and increase the number of servers and set up everything so for that we can use uh, something like auto scaling groups where you already have the pre configured uh, launch templates that uh, and you can give it uh, various metrics so sg can scale based on like uh, metric based so like uh, suppose average cpu utilization it can also you uh, like scale based on maybe number of requests going to per instance so that is another thing or you can create your own custom metric uh, whatever you want and then scale based using that metric uh, for your needs okay uh, now have you have you done any sort of monitoring on on any applications uh i have not done as per se but i use cloudwatch whenever i like require to like check something if something has happened or something but i haven't done specifically monitoring i have to created the dashboards using quicksight uh, uh 
uh, which is the native AWS services, mm -hmm. where we have monitored the like things like cost of our accounts and like uh, different S3 bucket size and everything else. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Can you explain me this term connection draining? Connection draining. So basically, it means that your connection is going to die. Like uh, it's it's finishing up all the things and it's uh, draining. Uh, it's uh, removing the connection. So. So what what does it do? Uh, connection draining. Uh, you're talking in terms of specific something or just general term connection drain. Oh, so so if an application is go going to die, what does the connection draining do? Uh, so it, uh, if there are any pending requests, it will finish up those requests and then it will go down. It will uh, like close that connection. Okay. Yep. Right. All right. Uh, now let's talk something about on the Docker and Kubernetes. So we do, we do have Docker. Uh, can you explain me the role of Kubernetes in Docker? So Kubernetes is the Docker a container orchestration platform. What it means is that it comes on top of Docker. So Docker uh, natively does, does not provide things like auto scaling, auto healing, or uh, uh, maybe load balancer type of things, uh, which the any enterprise level of application would require. So that's where a Kubernetes come. It adds a lot of feature that an enterprise require in order to operate their application. Uh, Docker does have something called Docker Swarm, but it's uh, not, I would say, uh, like uh, fulfills the requirement needed for the enterprise level of application. You can use it for small application, but I won't say for enterprise. Okay. So now in Kubernetes, there is something called as image pull policy. Yeah. Okay. Can you tell me about that? So image pool policy is uh, suppose you have created a Docker file and you want to specify your Docker file that when do you pull the image. So you can mention in image pool policy that if the image is not present locally, then you can pull it uh, from the registry. Okay. And what are the different uh, values that it accepts? Uh, I know one because I have used that one that is if not present in uh, current repository, but for others, maybe I'll need to like look up in documentation. Yeah, that's all right. So there are, there are two more, always and never. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, kind of. All right. So what do you understand by a service in Kubernetes and how many different types of services are there? Uh, so service is used uh, to offer features like uh, I said, load balancing. Mm -hmm. uh, it also has a feature called auto discovery. So it uh, automatically discovers the new instances coming up in your uh, cluster uh, for that specific application. And it does that by using the uh, thing called as selectors and labels. Uh, services has three types. The first is the cluster IP, which is default. It means that the whatever service you are exposing to the external world, it, uh, it sorry, whatever services you are exposing, it's only available within the cluster itself. Second is the node port, which means that the services are available to the clients or the servers that has access to the node on which the Kubernetes cluster is running. And third is the load balancer, where the cloud providers come in picture, where you can expose it to the external world by using external application load balancers like ALB, ALB. All right. Uh, now in Kubernetes, you have got deployments and you have got daemon sets. Yeah. Can you tell me the difference between both of them? I remember deployment. I don't remember daemon set to be honest. The deployment is basically for uh, if you want to uh, deploy your application and have the capability as I say auto healing or auto scaling. So that's when you can use a uh, deployment. In deployment, you can mention different strategies like a uh, rolling uh, deployment or uh, maybe blue green deployment, something like that. So that's what we use the deployment. I can't remember demon set. I have read about that, but I have not used it. All right. So deployment makes the pod available in any node, but demons yeah. that it makes sure that the replica runs in each and every node in the cluster. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now about RDS, uh, can you tell me that the different types of uh, SQL and NoSQL databases and what's the difference between them? 
So RDS is the service offered by AWS called the Relational Database Services. Uh, so Relational means the SQL, which means the structured databases. So that uh, has various things like PostgreSQL, then MySQL, MSQL, uh, uh, like that. And um, uh, the other type of uh, database service is the NoSQL type, uh, which is uh, things like DynamoDB or um, uh, like MongoDB. Uh, so where your data is not structured and the data is stored in a key value kind of uh, format rather than the structured column wise format in SQL. Okay. Uh, any more differences that you can think of? Uh, so you can like uh, NoSQL is very scalable. Uh, like DynamoDB, you can store like millions and billions of record in it. And it's very resilient in terms of that, whereas your MySQL is not meant for that purpose. All right. So now coming back to your experience, uh, can you tell me about a, about a scenario where um, you really struggled in some of the cases or something that was very hard to do and then uh, what happened to that finally? Did you achieve it or not? Okay. Mm. So yeah, um, like recently there was a once uh, as I might have mentioned in my resume that I also work on security things. Mm -hmm. So there was recently one finding that came that uh, our clients had lots of Lambda functions running uh, mm -hmm. uh, on the AWS Lambda and all of them were using the runtimes which were deprecated by the AWS. So that means there were no security patches, nothing, and it could be vulnerable to the security vulnerabilities. And they were around 1300 functions, which our clients had on Lambda. And uh, no one, like I took the responsibility to upgrade it then. Uh, and 850 were around Pythons and rest of the were of Node.js. So for Node.js, I took help of someone else in my team who uh, has the experience on Node.js, whether as Python, I myself have uh, the experience. So I did them on my own. So the challenges I faced in that was their Lambda. So there are two types, uh, types of functions. So one that uses the layers and one that does not use this layer. So the one that does not use this layer, it was easy to upgrade them. So I just created a simple Python script. And because the Python syntax for 3.7 and 3.9 was almost similar, there were no differences or nothing that needs to be changed. So that I uh, completed like in just few days. And then there were the next set of functions that were the layers one. So in that I had to like then do some manual things also where like I automated the process of creating and updating layers by using the AWS CLI. So the layers were updated, but then I had to contact to the various team. Those were the, uh, handling those applications, uh, uh, those functions. And then, yeah, so it was like a big process. And at first I thought like, 1300 functions that's a lot and like how can i complete this but it needed to do that so yeah i completed it and i almost at the end so i have around 150 functions remaining out of those 1300 and yeah i will be finishing it in just few days okay that. uh all right i i think i'm done with the the questions and answers uh so my feedback to you is that you did pretty well. Uh, you answered uh, almost all the questions. And uh, yep, so I'll be closing up this recording now and I'll be giving you more uh, feedback after the recording is done. Thanks for your okay. time. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you.